as I was saying, one of the topics that I've been asked to speak about um, by people is just on forgiveness and accepting forgiveness. And there's a lot of different theologies out there in the world. People disagree on all sorts of things, and those different in theologies between different Christian groups cause massive, massive schisms, don't they? Protestant, Catholic, Eastern, Western, um, evangelical, whatever. There's so many different theologies out there. But I think one thing that everyone who calls themselves a Christian can agree on is that Jesus died on the cross so that we can be forgiven. I think that's probably a single truth that everyone agrees on. Now, people then might disagree on the mechanism for how that works. I've spoken before about atonement theory and um, different penal substitution, Christus Victor, lots of different theories around the mechanism of how that forgiveness works. But that's not what I'm going to look at today. I have spoken on that before. There's a video online called um, Why Did Jesus Have to Die? Unthinking the Cross, which well, I give you my thoughts on that. But what I want to focus on today is accepting forgiveness and, and why that's so important. So, Bible's a good place to start. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. He bore, he himself bore our sins, that's Jesus. Jesus bore our sins in his body on the tree, the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Amen. That is the core of what we believe, isn't it? That by his wounds we have been healed. In other words, you are forgiven. Full stop. No ifs, no buts, you are forgiven. And we believe that, we know that. But what I want to try and unpick today is why do so many people struggle to receive that forgiveness and struggle to forgive themselves? We recognise that we have been forgiven by Jesus, but we still struggle to forgive ourselves when we get things wrong. And we hold on to that guilt. Um, I've shared before, a, I had a vision at one of our Friday evening encounter services, probably about a year ago now. And what I saw really clearly was a queue of people carrying heavy backpacks. And, and those backpacks represented their guilt, their shame, their sin, whatever you want to call it. And these people went to Jesus with this heavy backpack, they laid down the backpack on the floor at Jesus' feet, and Jesus picks it up and throws it off into the distance. And he says, your sin is forgiven. Now, he didn't ask any questions. He didn't attach any conditions to that forgiveness. There were no Hail Marys, no checking of baptism certificates, no discussion about, well, how sorry are you? Are you really sorry? There was no Bible knowledge check. There was no, you'll be forgiven if you can recite Revelation 4 verse 9. There was no church attendance criteria. There was no, you didn't have to prove that you regularly attended church to get forgiven. There was just unforgivable, unforgivable, unconditional forgiveness. Unforgivable conditionalness. Unfor I can't even say it. Unconditional forgiveness. Unconditional. But then, what I saw happening in this vision is that the people who'd had their sin in these backpacks thrown into the distance, they off they went, and they went looking for those backpacks. They'd been flung away miles. Jesus had done a, really tried to get rid of them. It wasn't an easy job because they had to go a long way to get them. But these people put effort into searching and gathering back up that guilt, that shame, and putting it back on their backs. They went miles in search of it. It was like they were so used to carrying that weight of guilt and shame that they couldn't get rid of it. That when it was gone, it didn't feel right, and they felt the need to put it back on again. So they went and they reclaimed it. Then they make their way back to the cross. 
They put it back down at Jesus' feet. Once again, he flings it into the distance and says, you are forgiven. And that process gets repeated on a loop. And we could probably all relate to that in some way. We all probably struggle in some way to get rid of that feeling of guilt for things that we, the mistakes that we've made. We have these regrets. So if only I'd done that differently, if only I'd acted this way, if only I'd said that to this person, if only I hadn't done that, how could life be different? How could somebody else's life be different? So why do we do that? Why do we hang on to those feelings of guilt? Jesus has forgotten about them. The cross was enough, but we hang on to them. Why do we do that? Well, I want to try and squash a few myths around forgiveness today. The first one is maybe that people think that their sin is too big to be forgiven. I've heard people say, well, doesn't the Bible say there are unforgivable sins? Well, yes, it does, actually. Should we examine that? This is Mark chapter 3, verse 28. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. Excellent. But, oh, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. That's in the Bible, that's Jesus speaking. It's not just in Mark, it's repeated in Matthew. So what's going on there? Because the idea that there are some sins that cannot be forgiven is a bit bizarre by how I understand God and in the context of the rest of the Bible. Yet Jesus said those words and we can't just ignore them. This is a case... I think Eileen said last week, or sometimes knowing your Bible too well can be a bad thing. Because if you try hard enough, you can always find a verse you can take out of context to back up your opinions. And this is one of those verses that people use. Well, it probably won't surprise you to know that this verse isn't quite what it seems. Let's unpick what blaspheming against the Holy Spirit might mean. On the surface, it sounds like, well, blasphemy is saying things against God, isn't it? Denying God, right? So this is denying or saying bad things about the Holy Spirit on the surface. And this is a really big topic. There's loads of deep theology in there, which I'm not, well, I have been reading, but I'm not going to go into detail on. But I want to try and summarize it for you. If you want to, I can give you some reading on this if you'd like. But one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is, the phrase is used, is the Holy Spirit is there to convict us of our sins. Which sounds a bit grim, doesn't it? Basically, what, what that means, if you translate it better, is the Holy Spirit is a bit like our conscience. Now, traditionally, when you think of a conscience, it's to tell you what's right and wrong, isn't it? I think Jiminy Cricket, oh, oh, is it Jiminy Cricket in Pinocchio? It's to show you what is right or wrong, good or evil. Well, that's not what I believe the Holy Spirit as a conscience does, because the tree of good and evil, if we think about the good and evil, that is literally barking up the wrong tree. What I think our conscience does is to show us when we stray away from the tree of life. Rather than good and evil or making moral judgments, it's to say when you are straying away from the tree of life. What people far more intelligent and um, theologically, with theological acumen more than me, what they genuinely believe, as Jesus meant by blasphemy, is the refusal to let the Holy Spirit guide us back to the tree of life. Blaspheming against the Holy Spirit is the refusal to follow the Holy Spirit conscience that guides us back to the tree of life when we stray away from it. In other words, it's refusal to recognise our own forgiveness. To put it simply, I think Jesus is saying here, 
If you refuse to let the Holy Spirit show you you're forgiven, you'll always live in condemnation. Not through God's choice, but through your own choice. God has forgiven you, but the reason for the unforgiveness is our refusal to accept that forgiveness. Does that make sense? He doesn't say anyone who blasphemes against. It's very, very specific. It's the Holy Spirit. It's not God. It's not Jesus. It's not the Trinity. It's not my Father. It's the Holy Spirit. And as far as I can see, the only explanation for why it's specific about the Holy Spirit is that Holy Spirit's role in showing us and leading us back to the tree of life. So the other version of this is in Matthew 12, a bit extended. For this reason, I tell you, people can be forgiven. This is verse 30. Um, any sin and any evil thing they say, but whoever says evil things against the Holy Spirit, that's blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, will not be forgiven. Anyone who says something against the Son of Man, that's himself, Jesus, can be forgiven. But whoever says something against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, ever. What he means is that you can be forgiven for anything. The only way you can not is just not to receive that forgiveness. And that is your choice by stopping yourself receiving that forgiveness. There is nothing that we can do that can make God love you less. The Bible is so clear on that. There is nothing you can do that can make God love you less. There is nothing you can do that God won't forgive you for. And there is nothing that, won't, that can separate you from God apart from the barriers that we put up ourselves that God desperately wants to tear down. And I think holding on to guilt and shame is one of those barriers that we put up to separate ourselves. God's love is still there. God's forgiveness is still there. God's goodness is still there. But we choose to block it out or block out elements of it because we've got this guilt and shame. Um, the next barrier I think some people face is this feeling that they deserve punishment. That they don't, I don't deserve to be forgiven. Well, I love the mirror translation of John 3.18. So obviously John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. John 3.17 is that Jesus came to bring light being life and not condemn the world. John 3, 18 in the mirror is this. In the persuasion of your authentic sonship, there is no separation or rejection. For someone to prefer not to embrace this is to remain under their own judgment, sustained by their futile efforts to define themselves through personal performance. In their stubborn unbelief, they reject what is revealed and redeemed. Let me translate that for you a little bit. If you recognise who you are in God, if we recognise that we are his child under authentic sonship, then there can be no separation or rejection from him. But if you choose to be separate yourself, then you can remain under your own judgment. Not God's judgment. You can remain under your own judgment. It's a mindset thing. It can be really hard to think of ourselves as worthy when so much of the world tells us that we're not. When so much of the world seeks to put you down and show you how other people are better than you, richer than you, cleverer than you, prettier than you, braver than you. When the world seeks to tell you that you're not good enough, it can be really hard to maintain that mindset of that I am worthy and I am, uh, I am acceptable for forgiveness. The, we've all come across the um, woe to me brigade, as I like to call them. The, I'm so unworthy, I don't deserve grace, I've got so much wrong. Well, you know what we just said about blaspheming against the Spirit? This is it. Blaspheming against the Spirit, I think, is most evident by when, when we adopt that attitude, which I have at times, of, I'm unworthy, I don't deserve grace, I've got so much wrong, I don't deserve to be forgiven. Because the Spirit is trying to convict us back to the tree of life to show us that that's not true. 
We've all been there. When the Spirit says that you're enough. Hello. Hello. Welcome to join us, sir. I'm just um, not at the moment. No, we can, yeah. well, we can make you a coffee, why not? <laughs> um, so, yeah. When the Spirit says that you're not enough, you can reply and you say, no, I'm incomplete. When the Spirit says you are worthy, you reply and say, no, I've made too many mistakes. When the Spirit says you are powerful, you reply, no, I'm insignificant. When the Spirit says you are loved, you reply, no, I am nothing. When the Spirit says you are forgiven, you reply, no, I am guilty. That is a blasphemy against the Spirit that makes you not be forgiven by yourself. That denying of your own identity in Christ, that's a mindset we need to swap. Let's be really clear. You are righteous, you are worthy, and you are holy. Your response to all of those things that the Spirit says should be, yes, I am. Don't just believe me, believe the Bible, Romans 8, 1. There is no condemnation now for those who live in union with Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Jeremiah 31, 34. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Hundreds of verses like that in the Bible. So how do we change that mindset and start to value ourselves the way that God does? It's not easy. But what we do is we engage more in activities that reflect Jesus and we engage less in activities that don't. We engage more in activities that reflect Jesus and less in ones that don't. Social media, for example. Social media is great. It has so many blessings. But if you're in groups or you have friends on social media that make you feel unworthy or make you feel not good enough, get out of it. If a TikTok, Instagram, death scroll of beautiful people makes you feel insecure, then stop, scroll stop scrolling. I'm not going to tell you what's right and wrong. That's not my job. But what is helpful for one person might be destructive for another person. Some people might, might be able to harness things for good that to other people isn't. But if you know that something is healthy for you, then do more of it. That's what your conscience is about. That's what listening to the Spirit is about. And the Spirit convicts you that that is healthy for you. Do more of it. But if you know something is unhealthy, cut it out. And you know what? That applies to so-called Christian stuff as well. There is so much rubbish out there that claims to be from God, that claims to be biblical, and just isn't. If a preach or someone speaking ever makes you feel rubbish, cut it out. You should come out of church feeling better than when you went in. If it's not love, if it's not good, then it's not God. And whether it's pretending to be God or not, you need to cut it out. Just because something, someone is on television saying something, or on the internet or in a magazine saying something, and just because they claim to be from God, doesn't mean that they are. Use your own discernment. Use that conviction of the Holy Spirit. I was sent a prophecy by a former church member a few weeks ago. And... It was full of judgment. It was full of just stuff that was not God and was not love and was not good. I could have said, well, oh, this is a prophecy. It must be from God. Or I could have that discernment to go, no, I'm not accepting that. There's something else going on here because I know that God is good and God is love. It's not God. It's not good. Cut it out. What can we do? We can listen to worship music. We can spend time with our church family. We can read scripture. We can spend time in meditation. Eileen is great for this, um, doing some guided meditations just on stopping, taking some time out and reflecting on God. 
Time to let the Spirit reveal to us who we truly are. What do people say when they say, oh, I've sinned? They go, you need to repent. Repent. Well, what does the word repent really mean? We've covered this before. Turn around. Change your mind. The Greek is, I'm pronouncing this horribly, but something like metanu is what's translated as repent. And it literally means change your mind. Repent does not mean shuffle around feeling sorry for yourself to earn forgiveness. It doesn't mean getting on your knees and pleading with God, saying, please forgive me, I'm so rubbish, I'm so terrible, please forgive me, God. It doesn't mean that. It means changing your mindset. Don't argue with God. When the Spirit says you are enough, we need to reply with, yes, I am. When the Spirit says you are worthy, we reply, yes, I am. When the Spirit says you are powerful, we reply, yes, I am. When the Spirit says you are loved, we say, yes, I am. When the Spirit says you are forgiven, we say, yes, I am. When you take your backpack of guilt to God and he throws it away into the distance without question, it's gone. It's time to stop the cycle of going back, reclaiming it, putting it back on. You are worthy. The cross was enough to cover anything. God has forgiven you. Forgive yourself. Let's say these again one last time. When the Spirit says you are enough, we reply, yes, I am. When the Spirit says you are worthy, we reply, yes, I am. When the Spirit says you are powerful, we reply, yes. And when the Spirit says you are loved, we reply. And when the Spirit says you are forgiven, we say, yes, I am. No more blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Accept what he is saying. Claim it as yours. What's our phrase? Give thanks for what is already yours. We are enough. We are worthy. We are powerful. We are loved and we are forgiven. That is already ours. Let's give thanks for that. Let's claim it and live our life in accordance with that. Shall we pray? Father God, I just stand before you in awe and wonder that the God who made the universe thinks that I am enough, thinks that I'm worthy, thinks that I'm powerful, thinks that I'm loved, and that the God who made the universe forgives me for every silly, stupid mistake I've ever made. Help us to break that cycle of forgiveness, claiming it back, forgiveness, claiming it back, forgiveness, claiming it back. It stops. Help us to break that cycle and just accept forgiveness. Help us to accept who we are made to be in your image and move forward in that light. Just leaving behind all the guilt and the shame and moving forwards to do amazing things with you. Father God, convict us in the spirit. Amen. Have a blessed and wonderful week, people. Nice to see you, sir.